Can we pray? Come before the Lord and ask his great favor to be upon us and that his word would penetrate our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Father, we come before you and we are reminded once again that you are so good. Beyond our capacity to understand how good, how gracious, how great you are and you will always and forever be. We are here this morning to worship you. And we rejoice in this. We thank you that you have built within us the deep desire to worship you, to breathe new life into us, and to cause us to desire you from the very depths of our being. All that is a work from your gracious hand flowing from your most, most gracious heart. And so collectively we come to join together, and I pray what might be a heavenly chorus lifted up to you, an offering, a sacrifice, we pray, acceptable in your sight. And we come individually, Father, to, to gain a glimpse of you to reconnect with you, to be filled in our hearts once again of the great promises concerning you, and that our faith will be encouraged and you'll fan the flame of our faith so that, Father, we might be difference makers for you. Help us to see in your word, your Son, our Lord, in ways that maybe we haven't seen him to date. Something new, something fresh, some new gift of grace to make a difference in our lives here this morning. Father, we lift up those in the congregation, those that are here and those who are at home, who are hurting, who are struggling, who are suffering. We lift them up, Father, and pray that in this moment and in this hour, you'll touch them in a very, very special way. Heal their hearts. Heal their minds. Heal their bodies. Surround them. Surround them with those who can love on them, who can extend compassion to them, and that we can provide the care and the comfort that only you can provide as you work in and through us. And so, Father, we ask that you minister to us all here this day. And with that as well, we give you the worship and we give you the praise and we bow before your throne. We ask this in Christ's precious, precious name as always. Amen. Well, two weeks ago, <clears throat> I spoke out of Matthew chapter 16 as it relates to Christ's identity, uh, the goal that there would be some sense of clarity. And in this great chapter, we find our Lord coming to the disciples and asking a simple question. He leads them up the Jordan River some 25 miles to Caesarea Philippi, to the mega mall of world religions, to the mega mall of whatever God you choose to worship and you choose to serve. Our Lord brings the disciples right to the backdrop where the enclaves are filled with idols galore. And people bowing before one God after another God after another God. And he turns to his disciples and he asks a simple question. Who do the people say that I am? 
we could ask a similar question to those out in the world today, those out in the community today, those that live in our neighborhood today. Who do people say that Jesus Christ is? And then we can stand back and listen to many a misguided answer. Our Lord asked the disciples, what's the topic of conversation out there when it comes to who I am? And they responded and said, well, some would say that you're John the Baptist. Some might even say that you're Elijah, who is to come before the Messiah. Some would go so far as saying he's just one of the great prophets, maybe one of the greatest of prophets. Maybe he's the one that Moses proclaimed, that there'll be a far greater prophet to come. And then the Lord tightens the rope and asks emphatically, but you, who do you say I am? And it's here that Peter makes the great confession. It says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And our Lord responds and said, blessed are you, Simon, son of John, and blessed are you, not because you got it right, but because of how you got it right. This answer didn't come from within you. This answer came from above, speaking in and through you. It was a divine answer. And our Lord turns to Peter and says, you passed the divine exam, but only because you had divine help from above. It's a moment of clarity that Peter had because God was at work in and through him. I concluded that message on Peter's great confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, no mere human being. But I concluded that message with the statement that you can have incredible receptivity and still have a massive amount of distortion. We might call it spiritual static. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus reveals his identity. But then he goes on <clears throat> to reveal his intentions. He goes on to reveal his passion. He goes on to reveal his mission. <clears throat> and he instructs the disciples that he is to go to Jerusalem and that he is to suffer and that he is to be crucified. And the disciples, they don't understand. They don't understand to the point that Peter, who just made this incredible, great confession, turns and rebukes the Lord and says, no, you can't do that. And the Lord turns and gives one of the sternest rebukes that we're going to find in Scripture. Peter moves from this incredible moment where he makes this incredible statement from above concerning who Christ is only to turn around and in the blink of an eye be used of the enemy of our Lord to try to convince our Lord Jesus Christ not to do what he came to do. And he rebukes the Lord. And our Lord turns and rebukes him and says, get Behind me, Satanus. That one didn't come from above, Peter. That one came from far below. You can have incredible receptivity 
and still have a massive amount of distortion, which tells us as believers sometimes we can get it all so right, all so wonderfully right, and turn around and be so woefully, woefully wrong. Have you ever noticed that God's ways are not our ways? That his design is not our design? That his plans are not our plans? And that in most times and instances, it is beyond our capacity to cope or beyond our ability to comprehend. I think we see that clearly as it relates to John the Baptist. I mean, everybody missed it. And so the Lord provides a fun fact of faith. If they can stretch their faith far enough to believe it. Our Lord tells us, here's a curveball for you. John the Baptist was actually Elijah to come. But my, how they missed it. And so this case of mistaken identity, well, concerning John the Baptist, but also concerning the Messiah, they just missed it. It didn't fit their paradigm. didn't fit their understanding. We couldn't manage it. We We couldn't maintain it. We couldn't work with it. It just doesn't fit. And because of this, when our Lord laid out the plans and his intentions, it didn't line up. And hope quickly turned to despair. Hope quickly turned to a sense of defeat. Because if this was going to end in death, well, what kind of reign is that? What the disciples needed was clarity to eliminate the distortion. And what they needed was a mountaintop moment to give them something to hope in. What the disciples needed was a divine encounter. And my, oh my, were they about to get one. Turn to Matthew chapter 17. And I want us to look at verses 1 through 8. Matthew chapter 17. And six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John his brother and brought them up to a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three tabernacles here. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And when the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were very much afraid. And Jesus came to them and touched them and said, Arise, do not be afraid. And lifting up their eyes, They saw no one except Jesus 
and Jesus alone. It is said that great things take place on the mountain of God. The disciples were in for the experience of a lifetime to witness the transfiguration of Christ. He'd revealed his identity. He revealed his plans. And now he is about to reveal his deity. And as a result, it leaves the disciples on their faces before the living Lord. It's an amazing mountaintop moment. It consists of a series of divine movements or a series of divine scenes that guide us through this grand narrative. The first scene we see is that of divine intercession. Luke, in the parallel account, in the parallel passage, in Luke chapter 9, verse 28, he tells us that they were going to the mountain to pray. We're not sure of the exact mountain, various opinions, various interpretations. Some would say Mount Tabor. The vast majority would say Mount Hermon. And while we may not be certain of the location, we are certainly certain of Christ's intention. He was going to the mountain to pray. Our Lord was going to spend time, precious time, in the presence of his Father. This side of heaven, I think it's the closest thing to home that our Lord ever knew. We know that throughout Christ's ministry, he had no place to call home. He said, foxes have holes, birds have nests, everyone has something. But the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. The creator of all things, the heavens and the earth. And all that is within it. And he has no home. No place to call home. And yet the scriptures remind us that the Son of Man always had a place to pray. Luke chapter 5 verse 16. But he himself would often slip away to the wilderness. And he would be found praying in Luke chapter 6, verse 12. And it was at this time that he went off to the mountain to pray. And he spent the whole night in prayer with his father. Christ's home, his pillow, his comfort, his rest was always found in the presence of his father. I have to think that when our Lord became homesick, that he went to the mountaintop so that he could find home. It is said great things take place on the mountain of God. It can also be said amazing things happen when we pray. The anxiety that we have disappears replaced with an overwhelming sense of peace. The confusion in our minds is replaced with clarity of purpose. The lack of direction is replaced with guidance and wisdom from above. The soul that's aching, the soul that's hurting, finds comfort and is comforted by a love that embraces and overflows. Amazing things happen when we pray. Luke chapter 9, verse 29 tells us that as he was praying, his appearance became different. The second scene we see is our Lord's divine transformation. 
Matthew simply states, and he was transfigured before them. Prayer changes things. Prayer changes us. Our Lord was praying, and the most unbelievable change was about to occur. Luke omits that term, transformation, transfiguration, due to fear of pagan misunderstanding and misuse. So he simply says, as he was praying, his appearance became different. But that word in our passage, metamorpho, is used just four times in the New Testament. Here, again in Mark chapter 9, and then we find it in Romans 12, verse 2, and then we find it in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Only used four times, and it means to remodel or to change. And yet it means so much, much more. Carries the idea of to change completely or to change into another form. It's the idea of that which is truly on the inside now being manifested on the outside. Do not be conformed or fashioned by this world, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may then prove what is the will of God, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. But as you're transformed, that which is taking place within you becomes apparent, flowing out of you. Think of the idea of Transformers. Now that little toy or that movie series. And when our children were young, we had these little things called Transformers all over the house. I know that because I would step on them frequently. But these transformers looked like a little model car. But they would transform, and you would take them apart, and next thing you know, you've got a robot. That which is within becomes apparent for all to see. Prior to that, it's somewhat veiled, but there's something deep within. So the old song would be, Transformers, more than meets the eye. There's something more going on within just waiting to be revealed. That's where we get the English word metamorphosis. We think of that caterpillar, that ugly green caterpillar. Little barbs coming out of it that look like thorns. Nobody would even come close to wanting to touch it, let alone look at it. You look at that green thing and you're like, ugh. And we wonder about God's creation. How could such a thing exist? Yet they take the time to cast the cocoon. And then they lay down for a spell. As if God goes to work. And this ugly Thorny, pitiful caterpillar comes out this majestic, beautiful butterfly. Metamorphosis. It's what takes place in our lives. I look at that caterpillar, it's like looking in the mirror. Before I came to faith in Christ, before you came to faith in Christ, not a whole lot to offer. God settles us down, settles our soul. And by his grace, he breathes new life within us. And lo and behold, we are changed. In the rest of our lives, we allow him to work in and through us to transform us so that more and more that which is within begins to express itself for all to see. In this divine moment, Christ pulls back his humanity to reveal his glory full 
blown Shekinah glory. Matthew tells us that Christ's face shone like the sun and that his clothes were as white as light. Mark tells us that they became exceedingly white as no launderer can whiten them. Pure, undefiled, spotless, holy, glowing with the glory of God. How can they become whiter than the whitest white? I mean, how much whiter than white can you get? Scriptures would tell us His glory is brighter than the brightest sun. Now we should get this. A few weeks ago, we just had this recent solar eclipse. The whole world looked to the heavens to get a glimpse of this magical moment. But they couldn't just stare at the sky. Because you do that, and the rays could damage your retina. That's what the sun can do. Thousands and thousands, we how many miles away? And the sun can blind us. And so we had this solar eclipse. The people wearing these special glasses so that they could look up to the heavens, to just get a glimpse. Well, my boys and I, we thought, you know, the eclipse is happening today. We couldn't have timed it any better. I looked up on the phone. I looked up online. I went, whoa, it's happening right now. So uh, Philip and I, we went outside and we looked up and it's all clouds. And so you're looking up there. Now, as I looked right in the lights, that's not a good thing. And so we look up, but we can't see it because the clouds are there. But for a moment, the clouds kind of parted. And there was a a glimpse of the sun and part of the eclipse, and I could see it, and you could see the sun coming out, and it was enough to go, oh. And the clouds came back, and we kept looking for it to appear again. What you don't realize is if you're not wearing those special glasses through the clouds, through the fog, through the veiled darkness, Those rays are still cutting through and they can hurt your eyeballs. And then there was a moment. We're looking to just capture it again. It was was there a minute ago. And then the clouds parted for a second. And it was the full sun. And for a second, my eyes cringed. It was so bright, it hurt. They had warned us, you don't want to do that. You need to have protective eyewear when you look upon something so bright. i got to tell you, the rest of the day, my eyes were hurting. The sheer brightness and brilliance of the very sun. I only saw it for a second, but my eyes were affected. So I get why we're warned. We just can't take it. Our Lord pulled back his humanity, and he made the sun look silly. He made the sun look dull in comparison. If the sun is brilliant, the glory of the Son of God is blinding. And yet in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, it tells us that if we are to gaze upon his transformed glory, we are transformed into the same image from glory to glory. If we desire 
a changed life. I think we need to find ourselves at the mountain alone with our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't think we see the Lord alone unless we get alone with Him to find ourselves gazing upon His glory. And when we see Christ alone, when we bask in His glory, hopefully our lives are transformed. Something changes within us, within our hearts, within our minds, within our soul. And then we, like Moses, shine within our continents a small glimpse a small glimmer of the face of our Lord Jesus Christ. Divine transformation. The third scene we see is a divine conversation. In verses 3 to 4, we have what we might commonly call a fellowship with the saints. It's interesting to note that the parallel passage in Luke tells us the disciples were actually found sleeping. Can you imagine that? In the midst of this incredible moment, once again, the disciples are sawing logs. And when they woke up, they woke up to this incredible surprise. In verse 3, Matthew states emphatically, behold. It's one of three times you're going to find he says, behold. I mean, look. And then another time, look. And then another time, look. Behold. I mean, this thing is moving. And Matthew states emphatically, behold. Moses and Elijah appeared talking with Christ. may not seem like much to many of us, especially as we live in light of the New Testament. But this is significant beyond words. Both of these individuals had mountaintop experiences. Both at Mount Horeb are referred to as Mount Sinai. Exodus chapter 3, Moses and the burning bush. Exodus 19, Moses receives the law. Exodus 34, we find Moses coming down with his face shining. In 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah is at the Mount of Carmel and he's going against the prophets of Baal and God delivers him. 1 Kings chapter 19, Elijah's at Mount Horeb. And he's depressed. Feels dejected. Depressed. He looks for God in any way that he can find him. But Elijah starts with the big things first. Well, I'll find God in the strong winds and power. Find God in the earthquake. I'll find God in the fire. Then God comes along in the gentle breeze, whispers into the ear and into the heart of this great prophet, Elijah. Both are Old Testament prophets whose graves cannot be identified or located on land or in the air. Moses buried by the hand of the living God in Deuteronomy 34. Elijah was taken up by flaming chariots. Do you find that in 2 Kings chapter 2? And most Jews believe that Moses and Elijah would accompany the Messiah when he would come. They both represented the law. And the prophets, which was a common phrase to represent the whole of the Old Testament scriptures. Moses represented the law. Elijah represented the best of the prophets. Both spoke with God and both spoke for God. On Mount Horeb, they found the law. On Mount Hermon, they found grace. In Malachi chapter 4, verses 4 to 5, the Old Testament closes by reminding Israel to remember these two great saints. If you turn back 
just a book. You will leave the New Testament and you will find yourself in Malachi. And listen to how it closes. Malachi chapter 4, verse 4. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, even the statutes and ordinances which I commanded him in Horeb for all of Israel. Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah, the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And he will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the land with a curse. Both represented the law and the prophets. And everything God's Word has to say about the coming Redeemer, the coming Messiah, the coming of our great King and our great Lord. It's how the Old Testament concludes. Remember these two great saints. Amazing things take place on the mountain of God. And these two great saints remind us of that. Luke tells us that at the center of this divine discussion was the topic of Christ's departure or death which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. The Greek word for departure is where we get the English word exodus or deliverance. Moses was there to represent and remind of God's deliverance from the hand of Egypt. Elijah represented the prophets who foretold of the ultimate deliverance in the coming of the Messiah. Here we have these two giants of the faith standing in the presence of the Messiah, verifying and validating the very one who would be delivered for the salvation of our very soul. Peter was there to say, Lord, you can't do it. Moses and Elijah are standing there in the presence of the Messiah, reflecting and reminding and confirming, Lord Jesus, you have to do it. You must do it. And they're there to confirm that every word, every yacht, every tittle, every comma, every exclamation point is going to come true, and it's going to come true through you. My, how the disciples were misguided. But these two great saints stand in affirmation of what our Lord was about to do. They stood in solidarity covering the whole of the prophecies concerning Christ, that he alone would be the one to provide our deliverance or lead our exodus from death. The very thing that Peter and the disciples were trying to talk Christ out of, the very thing Peter had just told the Lord he cannot do, is the very thing Moses and Elijah are there to confirm Christ had to do. The disciples now witness these two pillars of faith affirm the scriptures that the Messiah would indeed be a suffering Messiah. Christ shared that with the disciples and they said, no way. These two great saints stand there as the disciples look on. And Luke tells us they were discussing this grand, the grand exodus, the grand deliverance that is going to happen at Jerusalem. That the Messiah would indeed be a suffering Messiah and that the cross was essential for our eternal deliverance and salvation. That the cross was necessary and that Christ's journey 
to Jerusalem was vital for any exodus to occur. There's incredible imagery here, especially with Moses and the Passover and the exodus and the blood that was necessary to be shed on a post and the firstborn having to die and having to die for sins in order for salvation, deliverance over sin and death to occur. Seems appropriate to stop at this point and to point our direction to the cross, to point our direction to communion. Moses and Elijah affirm Christ. We'll see next week that God the Father is going to affirm him as well. But this is a time for us to affirm, to acknowledge our Lord for his glory and for his sacrifice. The disciples needed a divine moment. We need a divine moment as well. That's what communion does for us. It causes us to go to the mountain. It causes us to have a divine moment where we get away and we can be alone with our Lord and our Savior. Now we'll pick up the rest of this great narrative next week. But what a great place to pause and to be still. Have a divine moment with our Lord. As those would come forward to help distribute the elements, I would ask that you just simply bow. Take the time to ask the Lord to have a divine moment with you. To provide clarity. To provide hope but to be reminded once again of this great exodus that we are a part of because our Lord went to the cross on our behalf.